Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for joining us today for our online session on the safety and health of volunteers. Um, as the outbreak of COVID-19 continues to grow globally, IAVE is ready to help volunteers and volunteer organizations to deal with the, the challenges it presents. Um, we have prepared a series of webinars and resources to help you best respond to this global crisis. And that includes our webinar today. A couple of housekeeping announcements as we start. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in our COVID-19 response website. We'll make sure to share that with you. For questions, when it's time for questions, you will see a questions box. Please type them there and our moderator will convey them to our presenter. I would like to start uh, presenting um, our moderator for today's session, Wendy Osborne. Wendy is the former Chief Executive Officer for Volunteer Now and has worked within the voluntary and community sector for over 25 years, including serving on the board of a number of local and international organizations and as an advisor of um, initiatives like the UK London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, advising them on everything related um, to volunteering. In, 20, in, in 2001, Wendy was uh, awarded the Order of the British Empire for her services to volunteering. Thank you very much, Wendy, for joining us today. I hope everyone is staying safe and well in these concerning times. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Raida. And I am delighted to moderate this session in really what is quite difficult circumstances, extraordinary circumstances for everyone uh, around the world. Um, I want to start by welcoming our presenter, Stuart Garland from Volunteer Ireland. It's quite unusual. I'm in one part of the island of Ireland and he is sitting in another part of the island of Ireland. Um, and we have been uh, working colleagues for quite a while. So I'm delighted to have Stuart uh, join us. I have uh, a, a, few, a few slides that I want to start the uh, the webinar off with and um, I think my colleague Jessica is going to put those up on the screen but I want to start by saying that these are really challenging circumstances because we are all vulnerable we are all vulnerable everywhere and therefore when everybody feels vulnerable it is particularly in the world of volunteering that we inhabit, it is difficult because the big question is what capacity do we have to help if we are all vulnerable? How do we define the risk regarding our vulnerability and what help can we actually give? So, and uh, you know, and today we will be exploring some of that for you and with you in order to help you also deal with the big questions. I have a quote um, which should be coming up on the screen. And this quote is written by a, an academic, a writer and a, a techno sociologist, um, quite well known in terms of TED Talks, um, Zeynep Tufeki. And I think it's really, it's really important. It goes to the heart of, you know, when we're even, even when we're all vulnerable, what capacity do we have to help? Uh, and you know, clearly there it is, preparing for the almost inevitable global spread of this virus, now dubbed COVID-19, is one of the most pro-social, altruistic things you can do in, res in, in response to this major global crisis. And she talks in the quote about our neighbours and helping our neighbours prepare. 
and helping our neighbours who are in need and helping our neighbours who are working in all of our health services across the world. And therefore, there is an impetus that no matter that we are all vulnerable, we can't do nothing. All of us, um, you know, have something uh, that we can actually contribute to our family, friends and our neighbours. So there is a general sense of call across the world for people to do what's right, to, uh, to help others and, uh, and, and in doing so to help all of us actually survive and work through this um, really uh, substantial crisis that is affecting everyone in the world. I think there are a few key issues in relation to volunteering that are clearly there and there should be another slide coming up. Maintaining current volunteer services provided to those most in need. I've worked in volunteering for a very long time and often volunteers are involved in reaching out to those who are most in need. Those who are ill, facing personal difficulties, children, adults, young people, older people, they're helping those most in need. So how do you actually maintain those kind of volunteer services when there actually is this global, national, local crisis? The next key issue for me is mobilizing volunteers effectively to help with the impact of the health crisis. People will want to help. And it's uh, in the United Kingdom. Just yesterday, the call went out from government for 250,000 volunteers to help with the current crisis to help in the health service. That could be with transport, it could be with delivering meals, it could be with keeping uh, in contact by phone with uh, people who are isolated. But already I think the figure is 170,000 plus people have signed up to do that volunteer role. So mobilizing volunteers becomes a key issue. Then the third thing is responding to what I'm referring to as spontaneous volunteers who want to help. People who in their street, in their, in their neighborhood, suddenly say, gosh, I really need to do something here. And there are lots of examples of that across the UK. And I would say, I'm sure Stuart will say this too, across the UK and Ireland, about people saying, right, we know there are older people on our street. How can we make sure that they get their groceries? How can we make sure they don't feel isolated? What can we do to help? So there is a feeling that people want to do something and as volunteer involving organisations, how do we respond to that effectively? And then of course, a key question has to be volunteers staying safe when supporting others. There is a risk factor here, I've said it, everyone is vulnerable. How can we make sure that our volunteers stay safe when they're reaching out to help others? And that is of course, a really important uh, aspect of good practice in terms of managing volunteers. And then lastly up on the slide is organizations accessing the right experience and tools. So what do organizations that involve volunteers that want to respond through volunteering and with volunteers to this crisis, what do they need? Have they got the right experience and tools to assess and manage risk correctly? Do they need to th think about insurance for their own organization and their volunteers? Are they aware of the important health and safety practices, including the information that comes from all our governments about staying safe? Do they know how to put that in practice and how to communicate that effectively? Have they, do they need access to training? I mean, these webinars are really very important because they enable people to have access to information and experience. And are there codes of behaviour, are there new codes of behaviour that organisations need to put in place to protect themselves, to protect the people they're helping and to protect the volunteers? Now, each of those key issues is huge in itself. And that's why I'm delighted that we have Stuart Garland with us um, on this webinar. Stuart comes to us with uh, a wealth of information. And he is, I think this might be the first webinar that IAVI is doing, but I would like to remind you that um, IAVI will be doing a series of webinars and putting information up on the IAVI website for the global community. But as I said, Stuart comes to us with a wealth of experience. 
being involved with Volunteer Ireland since 2014, but I think I was involved with Stuart through volunteering long before that. He is, uh, he is very involved with management and training, management and leadership training. And he clearly has experience of working with large numbers of volunteers and in terms of all of the good practice uh, related to volunteer management. So he comes with so this welcome with women and experience. experience. I have been personally very impressed with what Volunteer Ireland have on their website. And he'll be talking through some of that and talking through how best to deal with these key issues of um, keeping volunteers safe while still enabling people to help and offer help in this time of crisis. So Stuart, I'm happy to um, hand over to you. Ethan. Talk to you a little bit this afternoon about our situation here in Ireland in, in terms of how things are developing. Um, thanks very much for that uh, introduction there, Wendy. I know it's a little bit uh, edited out there at the beginning, so apologies for that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit this afternoon around our situation in Ireland and how things have developed. And I'd be really keen, I suppose, also to hear from yourselves in terms of how things have been developing for you. Um, we're all, I suppose, reacting to this very much, um, maybe necessarily in a, in a knee-jerk situation of this is something that we've seen coming from uh, late December, uh, early January this year, and as 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 it's moved uh, across the world, I suppose it's it's all taken us by effect in terms of of what we can do and how how we can act um, ourselves here in in all of our countries. I'm going to talk to you this afternoon, I suppose, a little bit about what's happening in Ireland um, and some of the measures that have been that have been put in place uh, by our government. And I suppose we're 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 very happy. Um, in terms of the relationship that we have with the government and um, I suppose their willingness to engage with us as volunteer involving organizations and uh, as the national volunteer infrastructure um, in terms of looking to us in terms of that instead of usually sometimes they may say well we will do this as government but very much at the moment they're taking their lead from us which is a really really positive thing. So just, I suppose, to, to put in perspective in terms of our numbers, I just want to place a few ideas in your head in terms of some of the challenges that we might have um, here in Ireland and, and some of the things we're looking at, not just now in terms of COVID-19, but into the future for volunteering. What, what changes will be, um, particularly in, in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, in, in the UK, um, in a lot of the European uh, countries, we have a, a very formal um, uh, volunteering infrastructure through organisations. But times like emergencies like this presents a situation where we see informal volunteering growing and exactly what, what uh, Wendy was mentioning there around episodic volunteering coming to the fore is, is quite interesting. So we've got 4.83 million uh, in the Republic of Ireland, I think about 1.8 or 1.9 million in, in Northern Ireland. In terms of ourselves in the Republic, we're number five in the uh, World Giving Index. And we're number seven in terms of the time that we give to volunteering. So about 40% of our population is volunteering. Always the big question though, even though we have formal volunteering, a lot of people will, will not refer to it as volunteering, that they, they will refer to it as giving a hand or helping out. They don't necessarily still recognize it as volunteering, although we're seeing younger people coming forward and that word is becoming more and more positive. As I say, a lot of those people are involved in formal volunteering through an organization. We have in the past have informal volunteering increasing at times, such as um, we had uh, an equality marriage referendum, we had an abortion referendum, where a lot of people got involved, were very, very keen, but were probably drawn in more so by the cause than actually thinking that they were volunteering. As we say, uh, we've seen a major increase in terms of the informal volunteering going on. And again, as Wendy was saying, our, our primary concern is around the safety of, of, of those people, particularly those that we're reaching out to, the elderly in the community who might be isolated or very, very vulnerable. And a lot of these people that are coming forward to volunteer have not volunteered before. So while we're very happy to have a high percentage of volunteering, we have a very, very different dynamic now of these people that are coming forward who are very enthusiastic, maybe over-enthusiastic, who want to get involved. Um, 
and and want to play their part but it's trying to find a place for them to play that part and everyone that comes forward to volunteer may not necessarily get the opportunity to volunteer and while i did this presentation i think about two days ago um we had 6230 people registered today that's up to close to 9000 people have registered specifically around covid-19 uh, based roles so while we're seeing a pull back in terms of some of our organizations that would normally provide services have stopped or they're 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 reducing the services that they are involved with we have a major amount of people through our own database that are coming through and um, that are that are interested in getting involved but it's that matching piece which is a really really important piece in terms of what the uh, local volunteer center network can do and what we can support through volunteer ireland so if we go back about three weeks uh, the government launched a plan around uh, COVID-19 and one element of that was around supporting the community response and that's broken down into three elements um, around encouraging and facilitating volunteering and that's through ourselves and Volunteer Ireland and the Volunteer Centre Network so that's about 28 volunteer centres providing community supports for older people um, as seen as sort of the most vulnerable that are out there um, and that's been done through an organization called Alone which works with older people they have telephone help support line and they have about 500 people that are currently uh, volunteering with them um, on, on this help line that, 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 um, that gives the opportunity for older people to ring in and have a chat or vice versa but also that they can get practical support so someone can go to the shop and pick up groceries for them or they can go to a pharmacy and pick up medicines for them all done by volunteers but that's growing from 500 to somewhere in excess of 5,000 volunteers so the challenges they're facing in that organization is around the training of those new volunteers coming in how they will how they will you know get involved in those organizations um, a lot of people want to do the, the community piece which is which we were encouraging of, of ho helping people on, on the local road but we're also seeing a lot of action that's taking place outside of that where people particularly on social media um, are setting up these websites and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide this one I suppose quite key to this I suppose is there's a large amount of given I suppose the, the size of the population there's a large amount of funding has been has been put into this that the government has committed um, basically we were we were given a blank check and and, and asked what did we want um, and we've we've we haven't had to really fight our corner where, where normally we do have to fight our corner and um, very much and justify things as there's a number of key actions they want to get done and they're trusting us and the volunteer centers to do that so that in itself of going well there's a lot of strain and stress on our volunteer centers and um, it's a great achievement for us um, in terms of, of of getting that recognition from from government some of the challenges that are there that in terms of our own database and this i suppose is only people that will come through the volunteer center so it's up to people to decide whether they want to go to an organization directly themselves whether they want to google it and find out about it or they want to go through our database and, and work at the volunteer centers but of the hundred thousand people that we have registered on there at the moment 10,300 are aged 50 to 64 and 2,070 are aged 65 plus which put them technically into those at-risk categories in terms of COVID-19 so the challenge there for us is that we need to be bringing in new younger people um, but we need to we need to upskill those people that are coming into those roles those people that have been involved in volunteering for a long period of time maybe possibly in multiple roles won't necessarily be able to volunteer so that's one of the challenges that we're looking at is is trying to again ensure within those organizations that we're supporting them to bring in people and not just looking at the now but in six or seven or eight months time how do we actually deal with those particular pieces outside of the work that we're doing as i mentioned to you on the last slide we have at least um, and again this is another growing number of um a, a two databases were set up last week and um, basically online platforms uh where people had said oh they wanted to do something in their community and we're like that's absolutely great so they got 7530 registered people on one of those portals and on the other side so people were going oh i can i can pick up shopping i live here and it was on a google map but on the other side of that there was only three requests for people looking for help because those that were most vulnerable either didn't have access to a smartphone or they didn't know this app was there so it was just completely unbalanced they did absolutely nothing around the data protection of those individuals they were sharing telephone numbers 
all of this information was available on, on their website. So the concept was 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 great, but unfortunately, it was being driven by technology, and I suppose that's our, our concern. And that is, it has to be the two-way piece. So we're trying to, I suppose, at the moment, link with those organisations and and see how they can build up the capacity. Again, I'm sure with yourselves that a lot of these organizations, no matter how big they are, how small their programs, it's one person who's the volunteer manager. He or she may be paid, uh, not always the case, but he or she is, is the lone person that has responsibility for it. And, and in one organization where, as I mentioned to you, in alone, the volunteer manager, who up until now has been dealing with 500 volunteers is now dealing with 5,000. And it's looking at all of those capacity issues. And for them is to say, how can we deliver the same type of service without diluting what we're doing to 5,000 people? And that's that's a big challenge for them at the moment. So what are we doing? There's a number of supports that we're providing. And I suppose, first of all, is around encouraging and signposting all of those uh, COVID-19 related roles on the eyeball database. So we've been very lucky that we've been involved with two press conferences with the government, with the Taoiseach, who's, who's our prime minister. Um, we've been on a number of appearances on, on TV. We've had volunteering on the front page of one of our national newspapers, which would be at any other time of the year impossible. Um, you would be buried in the newspaper. But now there's, there's a very keen interest from the media um, to get involved in that. With that obviously brings a lot of fingers pointing at us to make sure that we're, make, that we're being safe and diligent in what we're doing and protecting the volunteers that we're working with and the service users that they're going to be, that they're going to be engaging with. The second stage, I suppose, is around supporting volunteer involving organizations with a series of resources, tools, and online training. So you've seen some of those on, on the side of the slide and they're all available on our website. And we're developing those on an ongoing basis. We very much try to focus on informal volunteering and engaging organizations that wouldn't be engaging volunteers in the past. So we have a very good relationship with those through our volunteer centers or through Volunteer Ireland and we deliver a high level of training to those. We have a, a postgraduate uh, certificate in volunteer management, which just started in Ireland and Northern Ireland last year, which is a great achievement for us. But we're really realizing that we need to, to approach this from a, you know the very, very basic level of if someone is on Twitter and has an idea about engaging volunteers, just because this is a pandemic, an epidemic, an emergency, a crisis, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't mean that we need to throw volunteer management out the window. We still need to apply those practices. And there's very often in times like this, as people say, well, we don't need to do the screening or we don't need to do the risk assessment or the health and safety. And, and people will put themselves forward as well and say, I, I, I'm not concerned about the insurance, but again, it's about the sustainability of volunteering into 2021, 22 and beyond that, how that's going to change for all of us. And we want to make sure that those organizations that are doing great work now are around in two or three years time. We're also, um, I suppose in the past, we've had volunteer managers forums and we recognize, I suppose, the isolation for those volunteer managers or that they're getting these major requests put on them and, and how the challenge of, of trying to figure these things out. So we will have a series of online webinars where we're, where we're bringing people together, just that they can share ideas or talk about the challenges with them in a supported network. And that's going to be launching uh, next week. The volunteer centres themselves have been engaging with their local uh, volunteering involving organisations. And in Ireland, a lot of us are working from home at the moment. Um, nearly 99% of those um, that are engaged, it's only the emergency services, um, f food and essential services that, that, that are out working. So it's that the challenge of, of talking to volunteer managers and seeing how we can support them. And having that database there is, is one way that we can do that, of, of, of sharing those um, opportunities and making them available to people. But what we do realize is that at the moment, there's a percentage of people who would normally, um, if they were interested in volunteering, contacted their, their, um, their volunteer center where that's not there physically now. So there is that little piece of going, all the solutions necessarily aren't online of just going, well, we put all of this on a webinar or we put all of this in a video or whatever. There are people that are out there who are isolated and how we can how we can get out and reach and and, and engage with them and that's both from the volunteer side but also from from the um from the volunteers themselves the other piece i suppose and the big piece that we've been doing i suppose some people have been interested is that we have volunteers in the COVID 19 testing center so we have 
at the moment, um, I think around about 27 centres and we will have 50 centres around the country. The idea with these centres is that people are not presenting themselves at hospitals and um, that they can go to a test centre, get tested, um, they're welcomed and greeted by uh, volunteers, there are medical professionals that are there to uh, engage with them. Um, but it's to provide a warm welcome and take the details off those people, particularly in terms of tracing. Um, it takes around a couple of days um, for those tests to be returned around. There, it's a drive-in centre. They've been at a number of our uh, football stadiums and, um, and other facilities that are around the country. So those have popped up and we've been involved with those um, for the last two weeks. We have another centre that's opening this week, uh, managed by one of our volunteer centres. And that's quite a challenging um, role because you're coming into people who, as because they've they're coming to these centres, it's their doctor or their nurse that has identified that this person is showing the symptoms, uh, probably has COVID nineteen uh, coronavirus, and does need to be tested. So, the piece of work that we need to do there in terms of making sure that we're managing those risks is really really important. So, obviously, they're protected with personal protective equipment, but we've been quite, working quite closely with the health service executive around that. The challenge for them is that even though everybody has been known these things have been coming, we're, I suppose, we sometimes have to take the jump with those and go, here's our risk assessment, because we're asking to see, you know, we don't know the medical details of everything. We we don't have a full understanding of this. These are the experts. But sometimes the health service is saying to us, is like, well, we, we haven't developed one yet. So we're we're in the same position of you. Give us a look at yours. So while there's a willingness to share these things, sometimes we're having to take the, the precedence on that and develop those things. Now, last year, um, through my involvement with event volunteers, um, I got involved with health and safety. Um, so last year I was doing health and safety and manual handling and crowd science um, in terms of my uh, event management work. So that's been able to give me uh, the ability to do those risk assessments. But Again, I can only do a risk assessment for a project I'm working with. It's very difficult for me to do one that's remote on the other side of the country. I can't see those. So there's no two test centres are the same. And that's that's a lot of the challenge um, that's there on people at the moment is, is managing those risks, reducing them as much as we possibly can, but making sure that we've looked at every particular option of that. Our primary concern um, is the safeguarding protection of volunteers and the service users. And that goes without saying, and it's the same for our government to, to say in terms of the citizens, but that's our primary concern. We don't want to be putting people out there at risk. Um, and given sort of the age profile of volunteers, some people are in those categories already, and they, they are very well-meaning people that want to that want to get out there and volunteer. But unfortunately, we have to say to them is we, we can't let you volunteer at this moment in time. And that can be a struggle for people who, you know, are very keen, who want to be doing something. Um, they, they want to be playing a part in their community and you say, no, you can't. It's also been a challenge for our organizations like the Red Cross, the Order of Malta, St. John Amblins, where some of their members that have been involved for many years um, are now all of a sudden um, having to withdraw from services and they have to bring up, upskill their younger members. And I suppose it's trying to work with those organizations as well and say to them, is there a possibility for you to bring in civilian people to support the role? So if someone was looking after welfare of volunteers, could that, that could possibly be a member of the public. It doesn't need to be a member of you know, a, a trained first aid or a trained paramedic. Let that per person do what they're doing and bring in other people in additional support roles. Our big concern around is, is the informal volunteers that I suppose they're not being trained in the same way that they would be involved in uh, formal roles. And that's a big challenge. So uh, the, the work that's been done with ALONE at the moment is around the development of online e-learning and so forth. And you know, again, as the piece with technology is, is you can say these things are amazing and they're fantastic and they solve all the problems. But you could spend, and, and, and as they've done, is they've spent a lot of time trying to very quickly turn around training to then you realize, well, we left this out of, of, of a video. So we have to go back and we have to record the whole thing. And, and you then see, I suppose, why television programs or, tea or movies take so long to make. The whole production looks very good, but it's trying to have that fine line there in terms of going, what's online? What needs to be done face to face? What's the key messaging they want to get across? And a lot of these people that are coming into this episodic volunteering are very enthusiastic. And as I say, maybe over enthusiastic 
but it's trying to harness that and, and the difficulty for these volunteer managers is they they can't be on the ground with these people at the moment they're, they're having to let them out there but making sure that they're doing it in a safe manner a little bit of lack of understanding there in terms of volunteer management practice and while it's all different for us in in different places in the world and we're all at, at different levels in terms of what infrastructure we have or what training and so forth we have there's just this keen interest that's out there of people wanting to get involved and what we're trying to do is break that down into very small little nuggets for people to go very four simple steps instead of you know a whole huge program um, of doing something of going you need to look after your people that's the most important thing you need to do if you're taking on these volunteers you need to communicate with them and even to communicate nothing with them that's an important piece let them know that you're there um we've had volunteers from our own uh, program event volunteers contact us and they're just going hi i just wanted to make sure you were there and we're going yeah we're here and we're, we're glad to hear from you and just people having that voice and sometimes the voice of the volunteer manager for people who are very isolated is maybe the only voice they do hear. So it's important for us to keep that communication going. That piece, as well as I mentioned earlier, around the long-term effects is, a, is an important one, one that we're looking at to go a year down the road. Where, where will volunteering be? How, how will it have changed? Will have informal volunteering grown at a, at a much greater rate than it is in other places around the world because we've been primarily on this formal volunteering role. We know a lot of the organizations that aren't operating at the moment um, will challenge, will have challenges because um, of their inability to fundraise. So we have big cancer organizations, the Irish Cancer Society had a big fundraiser day that they normally have, Daffodil Day, they weren't able to hold that. So there'll be challenges. Some of those organizations won't be around in a year's time, but there will be others that have grown hugely um, in terms of their work and how we can support those and, and that shift. And also, not just that these people make themselves available uh, for this particular uh, emergency, but to encourage them to play a part, an active part in the role. Um, we, we, we have had some conversations where we were, where we were saying this, this 6,000 people that went on, onto a website uh, and, and joined this platform, and, and we've absolutely nothing against that. But if you go back before to November last year, these people were never in, they had never thought of volunteering ever before. Now, now there's this sudden interest in it. So we want to make sure that they have a good positive journey while they're here, even though we can't really control that because they'll be with other organizations, but that we want them to stay engaged and to be active citizens within their communities beyond that. And I suppose it has changed a lot in terms of people, even though we're at an early stage of it in Ireland, seeing what are the issues that are going on for them locally. The other issue is around the mental health and stress of volunteers in the future. And that we say even that we've had volunteers that are working in, in the uh, testing centres, that maybe in, in nine or 12 months time that, that someone might sit down and turn around and go, wow, I, I worked in that centre. And then all of a sudden, post-traumatically, they think, my God, I wonder how many of those people are still alive. And, and they tend start to process that thing now. So while this, the, the task that they're doing isn't you know they're not going in and saving lives in a hospital they have a role which is around making sure that people feel comfortable and welcome when they go into those centers but the stress of that may not appear now it may appear in nine or 12 months time and how can we and the government support volunteers around that complete lack of risk assessment um, in in those informal pieces and again while we have things like webinars and, and trying to make those tools available to people people don't know where to start with them and that's one of the big pieces of work we're going to be doing over the, the next the next week as i've mentioned already the i want to volunteer now and 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 that's you know annoyance that they can't do it straight away um is a big thing for people so again it's just trying to make sure that people realize look we hear that you're looking to volunteer there are lots of opportunities out there but please you know it's about matching matching the roles we've had lots of really interesting um, offers from companies and businesses as well in terms of their support, whether it's um, call centers, lots of things that people that have been offering in. This morning I heard um, we, we were being offered storage containers um, and skips to put rubbish into um, that a company that we should know, they, were, they just wanted to give their time. And the important piece is like to say, look, we'll hold on to your information. We'll, we'll see, but not to be taking everything because otherwise we just get into the storage business of having all of these tools that we don't need right now and what we've got to focus on right now is supporting the volunteers and again to remember that technology is not the full solution it is about that personal piece of volunteering 
is a really, really important piece. The bit I suppose we're saying to volunteer managers, and this is I suppose their key message that we're trying to get across to them in terms of their engagement, is, is that they look at balancing or rebalancing their workload. Um, and particularly if you're working from home, that can be the challenge of the phone can be ringing all day long or all night long and making sure we've, we've, we, we can balance ourselves in that. So again, I'm, I'm working at home here, but I'm, I'm still going on my lunch for an hour and I, I can go out and I can have a walk around. Um, and taking that little bit of a break and a space and, and, and having that personal lifetime. And there's, there's lots of stuff that I'm hearing from volunteers as well of the challenges that are going on for them in their lives. So making sure that you take that break is really, really important. Letting the volunteers know that they are appreciated. Really, you know, sometimes we can forget about that and then we go, oh, next December, we'll send a thank you on, on, on International Volunteer Day. That's too late, you know, that's what that day is about, but it's about the here and the now. So it's about using the communication tools that you've got and letting them know that they're playing a, a really important part in it. And no matter how small or how big of the thing that they're doing, you know, um, we've got the people, amazing people that are working in the hospitals for us. Um, and people might say, oh, well, we, you know, we're, we're doing, no, what we are doing as volunteers is really, really important. We've got to prioritize health above everything else. And again, you know, you might not have necessarily collected data from volunteers before um, in relation to being in one of their at-risk groups in terms of volunteer application forms. So now is the time, I suppose, you know, and it might seem a little bit intrusive for people where you didn't want to know their age or you didn't know to, need to know those conditions. So making sure, I suppose, that you're doing that in a fair and transparent manner for everyone. The risk assessment, again, things like uh, you know, a pandemic will not be mentioned in your insurance. Um, so now is maybe the time to look at your insurance policy, look at those things. You probably don't have it in your risk assessment and something that's happening in a pandemic may not actually be covered. And I don't mean a volunteer getting infected. It could just be something as simple as an accident or a trip or a fall or something like that. So making sure that you've got that in place. We're lucky in Volunteer Ireland that we have a number of years ago, we have a contingency plan, but um, we have a policy around that. And the important thing for volunteer managers, I suppose, is to realize that, you know, it can be a one man or a one woman show. So making sure that we have that thing in place, that if the volunteer manager or one of his or her team has to self-isolate, is there someone else there that can run that volunteer program if they haven't done so? And, and, and can the volunteer program continue or does it have to close? That's that really important piece. All right. Talking about illness, either for the volunteers or the volunteer managers, really, you know, if anyone is shown any sort of illness whatsoever or any of the signs and symptoms, they should be disengaging as soon as possible. Again, encouraging communication and to be as honest as you possibly can. So, you know, you will have volunteers, I suppose, that may come and, and say and reach out to you and go, you know, encourage people to ask questions because if one person is saying that question there's probably 20 other people that were afraid to ask that question so making sure that you are, are being as, as as open as you possibly can but in terms of your communication you as volunteer manager might be seen as the shining light and you will wear many hats but again as that piece of you're not expected to be a scientist or a doctor or a nurse so if you don't know the answer to something don't bluff your way you know there's lots of misinformation and you know crazy facts that are going around on social media at the moment much better to say i don't have the answer for that yet, for that at the moment we have the world health organization and all our, our health organizations at a national level are all following that so you know that is our referral point back to i don't have the answer for that i can find it out to you and come back to you don't be bluffing your way um, in relation to that Obviously, encouraging physical distancing as opposed to social distancing, the new name that they're using for it, and good hand hygiene. So again, anything that's coming down from the World Health Organization from that. And um, again, if, if volunteers can't continue with your organization for whatever reason, again, it's just looking at, at those particular other ways that they can get involved. So if the facility is closed and volunteers can no longer um, be involved, you know, you might involve volunteers themselves in terms of interviewing new people. So maybe they're doing online interviews for new volunteers that are, are coming into your organization. And again, they would have they would have that experience of knowing what the role is about and they could be checking up references too as well. So, you know, making sure that if it is possible um, to volunteer that those things can happen. If volunteering isn't to continue, to let people know as, as soon as possible and to keep them engaged. Don't just say the program is over and we'll see you in three or six or nine months time, is keep communicating with them. Let them know that, that you know you will need them back at some stage in, in the future. 
It might be that, that things change within your organization, the priorities in terms of the type of services you can or you can't deliver. So again, you might be upskilling volunteers from one area to another to maintain capacity to deliver those particular services. So be aware in terms of going, which ones are a priority and which ones should we drop on a health or safety basis or which ones you know, are not a priority at that particular time. And most importantly, I suppose, is making sure that you know, it can be very stressful for everyone at these particular times uh, as volunteer managers, but as, as volunteers as well, and making sure that we look at that, not just now, but into the future too as well. Our current actions um, are that we continue to engage with, with government, and that's been a, a two-way conversation, which has been a really, really positive one at a high level um, in terms of both our civil servants and our politicians too as well. Talking about engaging with your insurance companies and find out are you uncovered for a pandemic? It, sometimes those things aren't necessarily put in there. So make sure that it is uh, covered by your insurance policy. Talk a little bit about the legal implications and, and we've I suppose talked um, in terms of the legal implications for us here in the Republic of Ireland and obviously that will be different in, in different countries but look at, at, at the implications of the impact this might have on, on your organization. Now, obviously the health, safety and welfare uh, issues will continue to be, to be a piece for us, particularly as things change. So we might find that there are other groups um, that are, are particularly prevalent in, in the at-risk categories. The, the more we will find out about COVID-19 over the coming weeks and months may change how we do uh, our volunteering. We're also looking at that volunteer identification scheme for people that are going out of how we, might, um, how we might identify them in, in the community as, as good Samaritans as opposed to a few individuals who might be out there who want to take advantage of, of the situation. So making sure that we've, um, we've got them. We're also engaging with the primary responders as well. So the civil defense, the coast guard, the uh, lifeboats who are all, some of their roles have changed, but also the Order of Malta, the Red Cross, St. John's Ambulance as well. All of those in organizations to see how we can channel in some other volunteers with them. Through the Volunteer Centre Network, we're engaging with the, the broader and um, smaller community-based volunteer involving organisations. And again, is looking at those resourcing issues for what volunteer involving organisations are looking for on the ground. What are, what are the things that they read, need right now? And I suppose most importantly, we want to do is around, particularly the informal volunteering, is supporting and encouraging good practice within those organisations as much as we can. So that's it for me. Um, hopefully you find that uh, useful. These, I suppose, are, are just some of the, the, the key uh, social media messaging that we've been using in terms of encouraging people um, around those various tools to go back to our website. Um, we're not trying to replicate what others are doing in terms of messaging, um, whether that be hand washing or social distancing. All of those things are there already. So in our communication, we're very much trying to communicate with people and find what it is that volunteer involving organizations need uh, in Ireland at this particular moment in time. And that's going to be different for all of us from, from all of our different countries at any one particular stage. So hopefully you found that useful. There's my contact details and I'm gonna pan you back now to Wendy. So thanks for your attention, everyone. Many thanks, Stuart. Uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, the issues are quite complex. Um, and uh, I do hope that we will have uh, some questions from our participants. But I would like to kick off by kind of asking you just, there are a number of stakeholders involved here. So how important is partnership working? Um, it is really, really important, Wendy. And, and that's, I think, is, is 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 the key element to it and sometimes it can be that you know volunteers are are, are seen as the last rung on the ladder by, by some people and, and we've come across that in the past but i think we're very lucky that right now we're seen as 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 a, as a key solution as a, as a key engager in this and we're given that that same that same level of responsibility when when we're around the table and um, in terms of our, our discussions around that it is about what is best for volunteers. Um, we often say in Volunteer Ireland, we don't own volunteering. Uh, volunteering belongs to volunteers themselves. And whether people are involved in lots of different, whether it's informal or formal, or it's episodic, or it's slacktivism, as, as some people talk about. And some people find those things a challenge and go, well, that's not volunteering in our country. And, and what we're trying to do right now is 
is be everything to all of those people and trying to engage with those people where not say in the past we we would have knocked what they were doing and um, we would certainly encourage them but but now we have to take a leadership role and, and be pushing through in terms of good volunteer management practice that whoever is engaging is doing the best to look after their volunteers Okay, I, I, I um, just yeah, also to just ask, also uh, to ask Stuart, uh, Stuart, the resources that you have on the website are free to anyone? Yes, they are, yeah. Um, all the resources are free. And then our training, um, I suppose we're, we're going from a, a public service point of view. Um, we're trying to reach the, the broadest audience that we possibly can. And we realise that uh, people are going to be tied um, from structure. So while, while we, we would normally be having a training calendar this year, we uh, at this time of the year, in terms of all of the, the basic, intermediate and the advanced level. Um, we're now focusing, I suppose, on in terms of communication with all of those. So everything will be is free at the moment and we will continue to be, be doing that for the foreseeable future. And we have been lucky, I suppose, in terms of the government support that will allow us to do that because um, resource-wise, we are dependent on a lot of our training that we deliver, but also our corporate volunteering, which which will not be happening over the next couple of months too as well. So it's it's important to engage with as a wide of an audience as we possibly can yeah and we've had a question, uh, a question asking uh, about asking engaging about virtually engaging with those people who really, people really want to volunteer to volunteer i suppose it goes to the heart of the matter it's really difficult people are working from home people are not doing face to face as it were so how uh can you give any tips about engaging virtually aging virtually potential volunteers yeah so so one of the things and i think it's a it's a little bit like this webinar is 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 what we're trying to do is not just provide live engagement but also recorded things because people have their children to look after because schools are closed in Ireland at the moment and um, so there's child minding stuff to be going on or people going to the shop so we're trying to ensure that we can engage people can engage with us at a time that suits that suits them but also to have a platform that people can come in and comfortably ch talk about the challenges that are there for them and if they're raising those challenges that we can be uh proactive in terms of our engagement with people and making sure that we're we're doing what the sector needs right now because i think for everyone you know while we can talk about standards and good practice not to say all those things go out the window at this particular time but we're engaging a whole new audience that are out there and we want to make sure that what they're doing is is good volunteer management practice but um again is um it's just making sure that that, it, that, that everyone is being catered for and there was another question around the whole area of risk management for volunteers, particularly, you know, um, where organisations may not have the best practice in place. Um, the questioner used the example of, you know, the government in the UK putting out a call for volunteers and therefore that, and therefore that kind of gives the, um, you know, um, approval rating to it. What about organisations who are involved in volunteers who are not perhaps au fait with good management practice? Au fait with good management practice. How can we guarantee the safety of the volunteer? Can we guarantee the safety of the volunteer? Yeah, that, that, that is a challenging one. And, and, and it can be very much dependent on, on the individuals that are involved of whether they've had previous experience of volunteering. And, and we don't know that at the moment. What, we, what we're seeing is a huge group of people who have never been involved in volunteering. So it's trying to teach them good practice, but to engage them. We don't want to overload them with um, everything that they just go, oh, well, that's a risk assessment and I don't need to do it. I'm trying to make it as simple as we possibly can for them to engage, to support them, to, to use risk management tools or to make sure they've got insurance in place or that they've thought about the, you know, things like volunteer policies or volunteer agreements or role descriptions, all of those things, but that we can, that we can help them and support them to do that. We don't want to be putting off people uh, um, about engaging where you know we're, we're not at that high level it's it's about in, engaging everyone at the, the lowest common denominator and that's i suppose what we're aiming so it's a, it is about that communication not just necessarily one way where maybe in the past we were saying all of these things are good practice where we're now i suppose trying to ask people where are you at and um, what would we like you to do and what's what's the bridge or the steps that we need to take from where you're at now to get you to the to the to the bare minimum and encourage you to do even better than that and another question just a, a, a fairly operational question but your test centers and the volunteers that are involved there um uh, and you know how do you therefore 
you know, guarantee the kind of physical distancing that is clearly very important in terms of minimizing risk? So, uh, yeah, there's a whole piece around that um, that we do. So when they arrive down in, so it's, it, it starts with a phone call. At the moment, um, some of the people that have been identified as 84 volunteer shifts per center um, across a week. So there's, there's an, uh, an early morning shift before lunchtime and, and one after it runs seven days a week. Um, and there's a whole training that's delivered there um, by a public health nurse. Um, for each group that goes in, it happens on a daily basis. Um, so it can be quite repetitive if someone's been there um, for two or more days, but we're also saying it's really, really important. Um, and, and volunteers, again, might be over enthusiastic and just going, oh, sure, I'll, I'll take the face mask off. And it's uh, what we've been hearing from the, the medical professions is not just about wearing the mask, it's, it's how you take it off and how you put it on or how you take on and off the gloves or the scrubs or the fact that oh, well, you know, these have to be thrown out afterwards and volunteers <laughs> by their very nature are going, oh, well, I won't throw this out, I'll hold on to it. And it's like getting that message across to people is really important. So at the moment, we're looking at seeing if we can additionally add in um, some online training. Um, but I'd be very, I suppose, I'd be very reluctant to call it training of just online awareness raising. And um, that that training has to take place with them on a daily basis. And um, volunteers have been very good and keen and engaged with that. But when that ramps up to whether we have all 50 centres uh, having volunteers in it, um, it's going to be a bit more, more of a challenge and making sure that that message is consistent across the board where somebody passes the message on to someone else to, to do a briefing is not going to be the very same thing as a medical professional doing that. But the medical professionals are, are are very much you know tied up in the roles and we we want to make sure that they're coming down and, and given those briefings and not that it's given to someone who may not 100 percent um understand it and we've also had a, a question from a, a company about you know they're they're having requests for volunteers um but the person managing the um, employee volunteering program is concerned oh, is about concerned the safety about of the those safety uh, corporate of those, volunteers. Uh, corporate um, well, I suppose if, it's, if it is a corporate volunteering, uh, for, for us in Ireland, I suppose I can give you the example is that um, it's no more than four people in, in one place at any one particular time. And um, so there's, there's a limitation on that. A lot of our corporate volunteering projects may be involved. It depends. Up, upwards usually of 30 volunteers, sometimes up to to two or three hundred, but it, it, I would say it's it's about looking at at seeing what that role is, what it involves, and um, what is the piece. Just before I, I came on the the webinar today, there, there was a request from one of our local authorities in terms of encouraging social distancing, and they wanted to get volunteers involved in that role. And it's you're going, okay, is 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 that a role for the police, or is it a role for the staff of the council? more so than is it a volunteer role because volunteer roles generally tend to be the positive ones in terms of engagement so i think it's about if you're asked to do something is it is exploring the, the you know the role what does it involve and um, what are the risks and, and looking at the world health organization's website in terms of those the social distancing pieces or whatever all of our volunteers in terms of the, the centers uh, the testing centers are, are fully trained but again it's that piece of people that are going out door to door so if they're going out delivering something Literally, they have to leave it on the doorstep and 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 step back the two meters, ring the bell, and 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 let the the the, uh, the person take in the goods that they're delivering. And then there has been a question about safety, safety for the people that are being helped. So you know, uh, and you talk about giving volunteers ID uh, so that they people recognise that they are uh, bona fide. Uh, uh, but how do you therefore protect people? From people who may abuse the whole issue of, uh, being, issue a of uh, being a volunteer. Yes, I suppose. Unfortunately, at the back of that, that is at the back of our mind, and it's at the back of minds of 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 people that we're engaging with. That there will be a few opportunistic individuals that will want to take advantage of this situation. And the police here in Ireland have already advised people of some unusual, different types of scams and um, that are appearing where elderly people are being phoned uh, in their homes and uh, not even being knocked on the door and told them that they you know they're ringing from the department of social welfare in terms of their pension payments and they need to get their bank details so there's that communication thing and, and what we're doing with alone i suppose is, is 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 trying to identify both sides of that of going you know what should what should the service user 
be expecting in terms of identification that the person is going to present to them. At the moment, a lot of that is going on at a, at a community level. So what we're seeing is that neighbors are dropping letters in the in uh, letter in the in the letter box of a neighbor that they know, and we're actively encouraging this and and leaving the telephone number instead of someone going knocking on someone's door or that I would be going from one side of the country to be helping people in the other at the other side of the country. We're trying to discourage that completely. And and where those, those things are happening is is trying to channel them through the organizations in terms of the, the work that they're doing. We have a good relationship with our National Vetting Bureau, which which um, is the, the, the screening, police screening for, for everyone. Um, and they have been able to fast track a number of the applications um, that were put through that are related to COVID-19. So we have priority on those. It's still less than five days of a turnaround. But we always say is that, you know, Garda vetting or as we call it, or police vetting in our, you know, it's just one element of volunteer screening and it's, you cannot rely on that. It'll only tell you whether someone has been caught committing a criminal act. It doesn't tell you whether, and I know we all have different screening uh, tools in all of our, our countries, but it doesn't tell you whether someone is a good or a bad person just because they have or they haven't committed a criminal act. So sometimes there can be an over-reliance on that. And that's what we're trying to work on at the moment is if we have all of these people that are keen and interested to get involved, physically we can't meet with them, what can we do and, and how we might possibly do that using online tools, but again, looking at things like referencing all of those. Back to you, Wen. Um, I have two more very quick questions. Okay, we had a quite a sizable number of questions, uh, which is excellent. Um, and I just want to squeeze two more in. Okay, so one is about, you know, this what I would call the safety net. Volunteers are often involved in offering a safety net for those most vulnerable. The the questioner and the participant was talking about, for instance, the volunteers who work with street children. But in our own country, Stuart, you know that volunteers are often working with very vulnerable people. So is there a danger that as we retract volunteer services because of safety, that the safety net for those individuals may get broken? May get broken. Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with the presenter on that one. Um, that's that's a really good point. Uh, we're, we're finding that a lot at the moment, not just in, in the voluntary sector, but in terms of youth work here in Ireland, where um, you know so people that are involved in street working and youth cafes, um, all of those things. Um, and trying to come up with, with, with a mechanism whereby these things can continue in, in some way. And obviously young people have been great and that they've been, they've been engaging with themselves, uh, with others uh, on various different platforms online and, and creating safe spaces for them to do that online. But again, what, what we're most concerned about in terms of volunteers is, that, is, is the most vulnerable, the ones that don't have a mobile phone who can't connect with other. And, you know, the social media has its, its good and bad points, but that's our primary concern is, is trying to reach out to those either the young people um, that, that, that don't have access to those tools or the same of the, the elderly people who are there who are feeling both vulnerable and isolated and probably are very very concerned in terms of what they're reading in the media at the moment and, and have those fears so it's trying to allay those fears and, and that's a challenge that's that's there and it's, it's one we're trying to work through but going back I suppose to the partnership thing we were talking about earlier is that's the piece in trying to engage with other organizations and coming up with you know innovative solutions which may not have possibly happened maybe before because someone would go well that's our organization that's the way we do it and um, where now people are taking a much more joined up approach in terms of going we're talking about society and the future of the country the world um, and everything that's around us not just people being stuck in in, in pigeonholes and, and that can be hard I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to come up against those things in the future but that's one of the challenges that's 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 that people I, I hope and I think are, are are working around that collaborative piece. Back to you, Andy. And the final question, and the final question is, about, is virtual about, virtual about virtual volunteering. Do you think there will first of all be a rise with this will first of all be a rise in interest in, in, in virtual volunteering? And how do you are you offering opportunities to do are you offering opportunities that might be self-isolating and so on to do something? Yes, um, so there is, uh, there's, a, there's a few tools that already have, um, and, and a positive way have, have, having, have, have developed around that, around people that are self-isolating and, and, and for them to connect with each other online. Um, we've seen a few other things that have been developed across Europe and we're, we're, we're looking at those at the moment. Just from, from an observation point of view of, of going, 
would these be worthy tools that we could possibly use? We've we've always had uh, virtual volunteering on on our database of opportunities, but it's it's been organisations that specifically did virtual volunteering roles. Now I suppose we're trying to reach out to other organisations and say, hey, are there roles within your organisation that could be done this way? Um, and trying to a little bit upskill and educate people in terms of looking at those other options in terms of engagement of not just thinking of formal volunteering roles, but all of the different ways that they can involve people in their organisations. Back to you, Wendy. I think that's really think all that's we have really time all... for on this webinar. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologise. Apparently, well, certainly you talk too fast, Stuart, and I do too. <laughs> um, and that's a cultural thing. The Irish uh, tend to talk very quickly. And uh, the second thing is that apparently I've had some feedback uh, uh, on, the, on, on, on my line. So I apologise for that too. Um, I'm sorry, uh, you know, these are all technical issues that no doubt um, will be resolved. But we have had, uh, you know, about 150 people participate. Um, I think, Stuart, you have done us proud. I'd like to really thank you for your input. Um, it's certainly been most informative. Uh, the webinar is, uh, uh, you know, will be available as part of the Reavery resources. We now have your written questions, and I think that's useful too, because uh, we can look at those and we can perhaps provide written answers to the questions as well on uh, the resources uh, pages. So that helps to share the knowledge. Um, I, I think we're almost out of time now, so it's just for me to say this is a really, really extraordinary circumstances. The world has become a very small place as we face really what is a health crisis that is beyond any of our imaginations in any of our lifetimes. And I think it is heartening that people do want to volunteer, even though they themselves may be vulnerable, because we all are. And I think it's up to us as volunteer involving organisations to enable that to happen and to enable it to happen in the safest possible way. And therefore sharing our resources, sharing our experience, sharing uh, our tools and all that we're doing is so very important. Um, so thank you again, Stuart, and thanks all the participants for joining, for us, joining us. Thank yeah. you.